Welcome back to the second part of the system metabolism. So we're picking up where we left off, and we're going to start going through that table. And the first macronutrient we're going to talk about are carbohydrates. So these include our starches and our sugars, and you can see where they enter. So carbohydrates, uh, it's showing you some bread, love bread. Um, glucose is going to enter at that very beginning of our metabolic pathway, so into glycolysis. The primary usage of carbohydrates is for energy. So uh, carbohydrates are so carbohydrates are catabolized to make ATP, so adenosine triphosphate, and we know that these phosphates link together. This is a high energy bond, and that energy can be used just like money to fuel building projects or work for a cell. Okay, so there's two types of carbohydrates. There's going to be complex carbohydrates, and then there's simple carbohydrates. And so they're ingested in a variety of forms. And so complex carbohydrates, these are going to be large molecules, so starches. And we talked about starch when we talked about digestion. And we know that starches, they're going to be in bread, cereal, flour, pasta, rice, potatoes, and in vegetables. And so those are our complex carbohydrates. And plants store their energy as starch and then we store our energy as glycogen. And whenever you eat me, you're also getting some glycogen. So just large molecules. Simple carbohydrates are gonna be like your simple sugars. So they're gonna be in ripe fruits, soda, candy, milk, honey, sugar cane, high fructose corn syrup. And so I just kind of pulled this off the internet so you can kind of see all of these, this kind of showing you junk food. Um, potatoes are actually going to be starch, but I wanted you to have something to look at. So disaccharides, so di means two, saccharide refers to sugar. So examples are going to be milk sugar, like lactose, uh, cane sugar, beet sugar, uh, molasses, or table sugar, sucrose. Um, all of those are disaccharides, and those sugars are going to be broken down into their monomer units. And then the liver is going to take those single monomer units and convert all of them to glucose. So monosaccharides, there are some uh, simple sugars that we do ingest when you eat fruit. Fruit sugar is fructose. Uh, if you eat honey, you're also uh, eating fructose. But like I said, liver is going to convert all uh, other monosaccharides to glucose. And then glucose enters glycolysis. All right, so you've heard a lot about sugar. So why are simple carbohydrates bad? Simple, they're already in their monomer units, so they get absorbed rather quickly, which leads to blood sugar spikes and then also crashes. Because remember, homeostasis is kind of like a man walking on a tightrope, and so there's always some variability, and it, the body doesn't always get it immediately right at the set point, so it can kind of overshoot sometimes. Other things about simple sugars is that they move through the stomach the fastest, and so you get hungrier sooner. And so if you're hungrier sooner, you're gonna consume more calories overall. The other thing about simple sugars, they don't contain any fiber, and we know that fiber is necessary for roughage in our diet. Also, a lot of those foods that contain high amounts of simple sugars, especially high fructose corn syrup, we need now know that they raise our blood triglyceride levels, and high triglyceride levels are linked to cardiovascular disease. We'll talk about that when we talk about fat. They're really consumed in excess because sugar is cheap, uh, So and also they're everywhere. So they're really high, sugar is really high in processed foods, and let's face it, sugar tastes good. I actually have a minor in, in food science, and if I learned anything that I still remember, it's like, food is a money business. And so if they can get you to like their food better, you're gonna buy that food. And we like sugar, sugar tastes good. So they just kind of continually up that sugar level to get you to like their product more. Um, go ahead and Google like amount of sugars in soft drinks over history. Uh, soft drinks have continually uh, gotten sweeter and sweeter. And that's once again, just to drive the consumer to consume their product. So I'm gonna look at this. You can go ahead and look at the verbiage. So it's kind of showing you carbohydrates. So we know complex carbohydrates like starches and we have our sugars over here. So sucrose, table sugar, maltose, which are those two carbon units broken off of starch, and then lactose is dairy sugar. And so they get, through digestion, they get broken down into their monomer units. So we have monosaccharides. And then the number one use of sugars or carbohydrates is gonna be for energy. So through that cellular respiration we just looked at. 
We also know that the body can store carbohydrates through glycogenesis, so the genesis of glycogen, and then liver and skeletal muscle cells store glycogen. If we have an excess, then the body's gonna go through lipogenesis, so the genesis of lipids, so making of lipids, and we will store our excess as fat in adipose tissue. So as far as carbohydrate daily requirements, um, recommended daily intake of carbohydrates is 45 to 65% of your total calories or 130 grams. Uh, that really isn't a problem. The average daily American diet yet consumes about 50% of carbohydrates. The thing is the form we're consuming them in. So it's recommended that we should consume mostly complex carbohydrates, so whole grains and vegetables, and that we should limit the amount of simple carbohydrates. High amounts of sugars can lead to obesity as well as nutritional deficits. You can be well fed, you can get enough calories, but you can be malnourished. And like I said, there's the American diet, 50% carbohydrates. And like I said, things like rice, pasta, or bread, they also fall in this group, so don't just think of sugars. And the reason we would tend to consume too many carbohydrates, because once again, they're inexpensive. So um, higher percentage of consumption is seen in low income groups. And we are gonna talk about obesity, how that does not hit all people groups equally. Um, sugary foods are the cheap foods. So if you are on a budget, a tight budget, um, you're going to buy those foods. And so that's one of the reasons for higher levels of obesity in low income groups. So let's talk fiber. Fiber is our indigestible waste. Sources of fiber are going to be grain products, fruits, vegetables, legumes, which are like beans and peas, nuts, and soy products. When we talk about insoluble fiber, this is fiber that doesn't dissolve in water. So things that are just think of things that are harder to chew. So really fibrousy foods, uh, cellulose and vegetables, whole grains, um, things that provide roughage. And we talked about that, um, the plant cell walls are made up of cellulose and we can't break the bonds in between uh, those glucose units. So that's a, that's a beta-like acidic bond. We just don't have enzymes to break that down. But we know that this insoluble fiber is gonna help move feces through the colon. So now let's talk about soluble fiber. So soluble fiber, once again, we still can't digest it, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna attract water, and this is, these are things that turn to gel. So think about things you can soak and they sort of change in their consistency. Uh, so things that are like easier to chew. So beans, fruits, oats, oats is a big one. Um, this is a very healthy kind of fiber because it reduces blood cholesterol levels. They're not really sure the mechanism of how it reduces these levels, um, but yet if you've ever eaten Cheerios, you probably saw this little heart on there. It says, can help lower cholesterol and reduce the risk of heart disease. Um, and that is because they think that when you consume this soluble fiber, it either soaks up bile salts and some of the cholesterol, or it does something to somehow reduce cholesterol absorption. But soluble fiber is also billed as a very healthy fiber to consume, to avoid heart disease. So barley, oats, beans. If you think about it, all these things swell when you put them in water. So let's talk about imbalances with carbohydrates. So clearly if you have an excess of carbohydrates, you're gonna get obesity. Um, obesity is tied to diabetes mellitus. We'll have its own separate thing about that. Dental caries, so cavities, if you don't have good oral hygiene. And then two, malnutrition. Um, you can really enjoy eating carbohydrates and so you can get enough calories, but that doesn't mean that you're getting your essential nutrients. So you won't be getting your essential amino acids or fatty acids if you're just consuming a diet high in carbohydrates. Deficiencies uh, can lead to beta metabolic acidosis. And this is the case when someone ha has diabetes and they can't absorb those carbohydrates that can lead to metabolic acidosis. Um, over here, if someone can't use carbohydrates, then they are forced to use fats or also proteins. And so right here, though, I kind of circled it for you. So incomplete oxidation of fatty acids lead to acidic ketone bodies. So um, we said that you saw ketones in the urine. It could mean fasting because someone's breaking down a whole bunch of fat, or it could be someone's uh, on that keto diet. So really, really low carbohydrates intake. Um, and so that's gonna shift 
if there are no carbs, the body's going to shift and use fat and proteins for this energy source. Okay, so this is your chart. This is kind of what I want you to know and what I put in your notes. So we talked about complex carbs, which are starches, things in bread, cereal, flour, pasta, rice, potatoes, vegetables. Um, complex are the healthiest. Simple carbohydrates, fruit, soda, candy, milk, honey, sugar cane. You want to limit those. And uh, fiber is indigestible. And so just kind of give you our calories. Remember, this really isn't going to be a storage molecule long term like fat is. But we can store our carbohydrates as glycogen and have to be stored in liver and skeletal muscles. And if we have excess, we can convert that to fat. As far as uses in the bodies, we do use ribose and deoxyribose. And also when a um, woman makes um, milk, that's also going to take sugars. We talked about the excesses, the diabetes mellitus, cavities, malnutrition, and then deficits, uh, metabolic acidosis resulting from accelerated fat usage for energy, particularly in someone with untreated diabetes. Okay, so let's talk about fats. So fats are lipids. The most common dietary lipid that we would consume are going to be triglycerides. We also eat other cells. We are also eating phospholipids in their uh, cell membranes and also cholesterol. Fats, as we said, the main function is long-term energy storage, and that's because gram per gram fats contain more than twice as much chemical energy as proteins. So that's why that is there. There are saturated fats and unsaturated fats, and then we're going to talk about trans fats. Um, like I said, triglycerides are found in plant-based and in animal-based foods, and they include, like I said, saturated, mostly going to be meat and fish, dairy, so milk, cream, butter, cheese, absolutely saturated. Tropical oils like palm and coconut oils are saturated. How you can tell a saturated fat from an unsaturated fat is saturated fats are solid at room temperature, and that's because their chains of fatty acids are straight and just structurally they can be compact and they form a solid. Unsaturated fats are in seeds, nuts, and plant oils, and unsaturated fats are the healthiest to consume. Unsaturated fats, meaning they're not saturated with hydrogen, they could accept more hydrogen, um, and they have double bonds um, on their fatty acids. Okay, so you've probably heard of omega-3s and omega-6s, and so those are our essential fats. And how you come up with that naming. So this is a triglyceride, so the backbone of a triglyceride is a glycerol molecule. This first fat up here at the top is a saturated fat. Notice it has no double bonds in it. This second fat in this triglyceride, notice that we count from this end, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this is the ninth carbon, and that's where we have a double bond. So this is an omega-9 unsaturated fat. This is a monounsaturated fat. Uh, it's actually very healthy, um, high in olive oil. And then this third fat, notice there's two double bonds, so that's polyunsaturated. And so we count one, two, three, four, five, six. This is an omega-6 fatty acid. So that's where you get that number from. Uh, omega means N, so you start counting from here. And so that's how you can tell what type of fatty acid it is. Okay. So I'm just kind of showing you this picture. It has a whole bunch of different oils on here, and you can look at your own leisure. But notice that oils are made up of a combination of types of fats. And so I just wanted you to know that different oils have different amounts of saturated versus unsaturated fats. And so the red is saturated. So notice your uh, coconut oil, which is a tropical oil, it is solid at room temperature, really high in saturated fat. Butter, solid at room temperature, high in saturated fat. Palm oil, lard, all of these are going to be solid at room temperature. Um, our essential fatty acids are omega-6 and omega-3, meaning we can't make those. Um, and then that omega-9, which is one that was on the other picture, that's really high in olive oil. And so uh, it's also believed that that is a healthy fat to consume, even though it isn't 
an, an essential fat. Um, it's desired because it actually lowers, it's believed to lower your LDL, so your lousy cholesterol levels. So I'll hit that later. Also, I just want you to know that meats have uh, different amounts of saturated versus unsaturated fats. And uh, this was put out by the Bison Company, so I don't exactly know how true these numbers are. But it's showing you there's total fat, saturated fat, amounts of cholesterol, um, and so things will have a different amount of saturated fat. Even though meat, it's all meat, um, there's just varying amounts of fat. So they're just, they're trying to sell you some bison. Uh, so they're just saying that bison is the substitute for beef and they're just showing you, oh, look how low it is in saturated fat. Um, but turkey takes the cake, it is the lowest in saturated fat. I'm not questioning their order, I'm more questioning their, their numbers. Because they are trying to sell you bison. Keep that in mind when you read stuff on the internet about diet. Okay, so let's talk about trans fats. So trans fats are bad. You've heard that they're bad. Uh, they increase the risk of heart disease and cancer. Uh, Europe has actually, I believe, um, if it's not in effect already, they banned trans fats and we're supposed to roll off of trans fats. So where you get trans fats, we have saturated and then we have unsaturated. And naturally occurring unsaturated are cis, meaning the H's are on the same side. And then when you artificially hydrogenate a vegetable oil to convert it to a solid, like it's typically done in margarine, um, I'm one of six kids. Uh, we didn't have a lot of butter in our lives. We had a lot of margarine because it's cheaper. And that is exactly why the food company did it. So you can hydrogenate uh, vegetable oils to make them solid at room temperature. Another advantage to artificially hydrogenating vegetable oils is when they're used in commercial baked goods, so think of, you know, like those Keebler cookies or something that can live on the shelves for like years, uh, it does prolong shelf life and it helps to preserve flavor. Um, another thing, when people reuse oils, I don't know if you heard this before, but you're not supposed to reuse your cooking oil over and over again because that too will increase, um, just naturally, you can get trans fats that way. So trans fats are the least healthy, and we are supposed to completely eliminate them from our diet. So food packaging, like I said, I have this minor in food science, um, I'm not really using other than this talk. Um, in the United States and Canada, limits of um, trans fats, and if you have to report it on your label or not, um, how it stands is trans fats can be declared as zero grams as long as a trans fat is below 0.5 grams per serving. And so I'm not picking on Ritz crackers. My daughter eats Ritz crackers. So if you love them, I'm so sorry. But whenever you see partially hydrogenated oil of any kind in your baked goods, there probably are some trans fats. How they're going to get around that, because 0.5 grams, that's not a lot to be honest with you. But what they're gonna do a lot of times is they will just adjust the serving size. So do pay attention to serving sizes. I don't know about you, but eating five crackers, I don't remember the last time I just ate five crackers. That also is gonna knock down the amount of calories and the amount of calories that come from fat. So just kind of be a smart label reader and notice you they have the zero grams, but oh look, it has hydrogenated oils. So that always is going to occur, you're going to get some trans fats from hydrogenated oil. So just be a smart consumer. So cholesterol, uh, this is uh, the cholesterol molecule. And so you have those four flat uh, hydrocarbon rings. And then this is going to be that functional group that can be changed. And this one down here too. And so it can be turned into something else. So cholesterol is abundant in liver, egg yolks, also to lesser extent in whole milk, butter, cheese, and meats. There is no cholesterol in foods of plant origins. It always cracks me up when it says, no cholesterol. I say, uh, yeah. Um, so 15% of cholesterol actually comes from the diet, and 85% of the cholesterol comes from your liver. So your liver will actually make it. And this is going to be through a negative feedback thing. So if you consume more cholesterol, that just means that the liver is going to make less. Um, we lose cholesterol from body when it's metabolized or secreted in bile salts. Um, and then too, that's going to end up being lost in feces. And so we need cholesterol in the body. So cholesterol is not all bad. Um, we, um, we have use of fats, so adipose, 
phospholipids in cell membranes, and then there's the cholesterol that's what I was looking for. Uh, we use cholesterol in our cell membranes. Um, we also use cholesterol to make sex hormones or steroid hormones. Um, we also use cholesterol in bile salts. So cholesterol is not all bad. The wrong kind of cholesterol carrier is bad, and we'll look at that in a little bit. Uh, cholesterol is also used to make those prostaglandins, um, which cause smooth muscle contractions. They're involved in blood pressure control and inflammation. So I just don't want you to get this idea that cholesterol is bad We're because I'm about to launch into cholesterol levels. So like I said, there are two essential fatty acids uh, that the liver cannot make. So omega-6 fatty acids, salinoleic acids, which is high in certain oils, so sunflower corn and avocado oil. So that's one of the, the crazes with avocado oil. Um, also omega-3, so linolenic is high in fatty fish, flax, and those uh, chia seeds. Both of these can be found in most vegetable oils. So this is just kind of showing triglycerides. We digest them to fatty acids and glycerol. We'll store our fats as triglycerides. We can make lipoproteins, which I'm about to talk about. Fatty acids uh, accept the essential fatty acids to be used in uh, our cell structures. We have to make cholesterol and then phospholipids. Uh, so your, your liver can manage all of your fats based on your body needs. So yep, it's magical. There you go. Uh, yep, I think I said that already. Okay, so dietary requirements of fat. So recommended daily uh, allowances, 20 to 35% of your caloric intake. Um, and so uh, Americans do not really have a problem uh, getting that. Um, but the thing is, it's the kind of fat. So this is put out by the American Heart Association. So love it. We should always try to eat unsaturated fats. So polyunsaturated or monounsaturated fats. So fish, avocado fat is, is going to fall in this group. Olive oil is what they're showing you. Definitely limit the amount of saturated fats to less than 10% of our allotments of fats. And then totally lose those trans fats because it raises those bad cholesterol levels. You actually don't, you're not required to take in cholesterol because your liver will actually make some. So excess of fats, guess what? Oh, look, obesity. Yeah, pretty much any excess in any of the nutrients, you're gonna end up with obesity. Increased risk of heart disease. There's a correlation between high fat diet, high triglycerides with heart disease. If you don't have enough fats, uh, there's gonna be weight loss, skin lesions due to loss of subcutaneous fats. So remember that subcutaneous layer is, is fat. And then two, it also acts as insulation, so heat loss. Um, so those are all problems with deficiencies of fat. So let's see if I forgot anything. Nope. So this is what I want you to study. Also, there's a quiz for you. All right, so we do need to take a little detour and talk about cholesterols and fats in the bloodstream. Cholesterol, it's essential to your well-being. But what do you really know about it? Let's start with the basics. What exactly is cholesterol? Well, it's a waxy, fat-like substance that's made in your liver and travels throughout your bloodstream. It's a key ingredient that your body needs to make new cells. But too much cholesterol can lead to serious problems, such as heart disease and stroke. Here's why. You see, there are actually two main types of cholesterol, LDL and HDL. LDL, or low-density lipoprotein, is sometimes called bad cholesterol because it can build up inside your arteries, which causes them to narrow, which can lead to heart disease or stroke. That's why you should try to keep your LDL low. Think of it this way. The L in LDL is for lower or lousy. On the other hand, HDL, or high-density lipoprotein, is the good kind of cholesterol. It carries LDL, the bad stuff, away from your arteries and back to your liver, where it's broken down and processed by your body. That's why you want your HDL to be higher. In this case, the H in HDL is for higher or healthy. There's actually a third component known as triglycerides, which plays a role in your cholesterol health. Triglycerides are the most common type of fat in your body. 
and their job is to store excess fat from your diet. Elevated triglycerides, along with low HDL and high LDL, can also increase your risk for cardiovascular disease, so it's important to keep your triglyceride levels low. For anyone who's had their cholesterol checked, it's only natural to focus on your cholesterol score or the actual numbers, but the numbers don't really tell the whole story about your health. That's why it's important to discuss all of your risk factors with your healthcare provider, including risk factors that you can change, like eating a healthy diet, getting plenty of physical activity, and quitting smoking. Controlling your cholesterol may be easier than you think, but it all starts with getting your cholesterol checked. It's a quick and easy test. So if you're due to have your levels checked, or if you never had them checked, make it a priority. Taking the next step in managing your health is as easy as CCC. Check, change, and control your cholesterol. Get started now by visiting heart.org slash cholesterol. Okay, so just like I said, why do we care? Uh, there's a correlation between a high saturated fat diet, high triglycerides, and high cholesterol levels to atherosclerosis. Notice I said correlation and not causation, but to be honest, a lot of nutrition and the guidelines and a lot of conclusions people are drawing are based strictly on correlation, not exactly causation. But we do know that clogged arteries, we know that those are bad um, because they can lead to stroke and heart attacks, and cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death. So lipids are packaged in lipoproteins, and there's four different types of lipoproteins. So the first one, chylomicrons, we talked about when we talked about the digestive system. We know that fats are absorbed uh, through the intestinal mucosa and then they get packaged in this lipoprotein. And so all that means is it has uh, lipids and proteins. That's really it. So we have this uh, bilayer that's got proteins embedded in it and then it's just stuffed full of fat. Uh, so lipoproteins, the chylomicrons um, then are absorbed into the lacteals, they're going to go deliver their fat to adipose tissue, muscles, and then they end up in the liver, and then the liver is going to process fat. And so these fat carriers, so these lipoproteins, are given these names based on their density. So if something has a high density, that means it's more protein than fat. If something has a low density, it's more fat than protein. And so we have v VLDLs, very low density lipoproteins, LDLs, low density lipoproteins and HDLs, high density lipoproteins. And I'd rather do this, that's for you. I'm just gonna click to this next picture. So we already talked about chylomicrons and so it just says that a majority of our fats from our diet are gonna be triglycerides. These very low density lipoproteins are gonna be really high in fat. Um, so that's why they have a uh, very low density because they're mostly fat. And VLDLs aren't very good for you either because this is fat that's destined to stay in the body. Um, the thing is, we don't have a test for it, so that's why you don't really hear about VLDLs very much. You do hear about LDLs and HDLs, and we just watched that, that LDLs are lousy uh, in the sense that they have lots of cholesterol, and then two, they are also going to stay in the body. So um, they are going to just be delivery vehicles and taking cholesterol throughout the body, and they aren't removed. So HDL is high density lipoprotein. That means it has more protein than it has fat. So purple is the protein. So we have more protein as we worked our way up so as we get that increase in density. And so these particular um, packages, so these particular lipoproteins, they are actually going back to the liver for the liver then to package in bile. Remember bile is cholesterol salt. And so they are leaving the body. When these are low, that's bad because usually that means someone has more LDL and these are the carriers that are staying in the bloodstream. And like I said, there's that correlation to cardiovascular disease, but these are the healthy ones. These are the ones that are leaving. Okay, so part of routine testing, it's not uncommon to do a lipoprotein profile. So the rule of thumb is you want those HDL levels to be higher than your lousy levels. You don't want total cholesterol to be over 200 milligrams per deciliter, so you want that to be there or below. You want those HDLs, how high is high, you at least want them to be above 60. If they're below 40, below 40, 
then that's bad. You want your LDLs, those lousy ones, um, not to be above 130th. So just like that TED Talk, really it's the ratio of good to bad that's more important than the actual numbers, and a physician would look at overall health and other risk factors involved. Okay, so this was just sort of a summation about fats and uh, cholesterol levels. So once again, we're down here. The reason why there are these recommendations on different types of fats, uh, these unsaturated fats, the polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats, um, they actually enhance uh, the excretion of cholesterol into bile salts, so they actually raise those healthy HDL, so high-density lipoproteins. You want to limit your amount of saturated fats because they actually stimulate the liver to synthesize cholesterol and inhibit cholesterol excretion from the body, so it actually raises those lousy, those low-density lipoproteins. Uh, trans fats you want to completely lose because it's a double whammy basically. So you're going to get an increase in the lousy kind, so low density lipoproteins, and you get a decrease in the healthy kind. And so that is one of the reasons why just totally eliminating trans fats uh, would be a good thing for everyone. So some of those other things that doctors are looking for, there actually now is something called metabolic syndrome. And so it's a cluster of five risk factors that double your chance of heart disease and increase your risk of diabetes um, times five. And so these five things, the more of these that you have, or the more of these a patient has, the higher their risk. So they don't have to have all of them to be in a risk, but these are all things that are all bad. So high waist circumference, um, high blood pressure, high blood glucose levels, high blood triglycerides, and low blood HDL levels. And so if someone has all five of these, then like I said, that really increases their risk of heart disease and increases their risk of diabetes. If you wanna see uh, to access your weight height ratio, you can just kind of click on those links. Okay, so I think that's a good place to stop and we will resume in part three.